I couldn't I couldn't resist putting Cookie Monster on here, but I know it's a bit silly. That's how I roll. Okay, so Cookie Monster. No, wait. Sessions and cookies. Um, so the way that the um, the internet was originally designed, as I mentioned last week, was basically kind of a lot less dynamic. So there was a lot less going on. Basically, you had a um, web server and it would f serve up files. And the original intention of like the web wasn't to have any state between transactions. So every time I request something, <coughs> It's just like a new thing, like some new random person on the internet has asked for something, okay, here you go. Someone else connects, uh, even if it's the same person, there was no way for web servers to maintain state between re requests and responses. Obviously, it, does, it makes a lot of sense to be able to maintain state, and the answer to that is um, through cookies. So. Um, they were first added to um, like Netscape to enable uh, like they, they were basically saying, well, how would we create a shopping cart? And the answer was basically, okay, we need a new thing. And they in created cookies, uh, and now all modern websites have the ability to to use cookies. So a cookie is a short amount of data, so it's like 4,096 bytes. Um, and typically the life of a cookie is that the server invents it and it sends the cookie to the web browser in the response. So the web browser says, hey, give me a website. It get, the, ser the server generates the cookie, tells the client what their cookies are. The, ser the client saves it on their end. And then the next time they go to the same website, the web server browser will automatically give the cookie back to the server. And the server knows it's the same person, or it receives that information again. Um, so it looks like this. So first of all, the browser just says, OK, give me index.html. The server responds back, and part of the response can set a cookie. So for example, the server says, OK, name equals Cliff. And then the next time my, I try and browse to another page on that same server, it will automatically send that through as well. So the browser has stored that locally, and it will feed it through. Now, in your web browser, you can look at the cookies that you've got stored locally, and you can edit them, actually. Um, so there's not really any security in terms of, like, the client has control over their cookies. But it's a way that the server basically maintains state between the things that you're doing on that website. So. A cookie can literally store anything, right? So you could say, like, I could store my name in a cookie. So, like, back in the back in the day, a website that says, "Welcome back, Cliff," I'd be like, "Oh, wow, this is amazing technology happening here." Um, but you know, nowadays we use cookies for a lot more. So we use them. Um, I guess the most interesting thing from a security perspective is cookies are often used to maintain um, information about sessions and or whether or not you're authenticated. So a session, typically you've got like this session ID that's generated by the server, typically by the server, sometimes by the client, and it is sent along each time you connect to the server, and when you log in, you tell the server your password, it then says, the server goes, ah, well session ID, you know, whatever it is, is this user on our system, and we trust that user, is, this, is that person. So on the server side, they basically bind your session ID with your identity, and that then gives you permission to do things on that website. I'll come back to why that's a problem. Cookies are also used to um, basically track you on the internet. So third-party tracking cookies. And I'm sure you all love those pop-ups that come up every time you go to any website ever and says, this website uses cookies because uh, currently we're in the EU, so um, you know, so we have um, some very annoying pop-ups all across the internet when we use when we use the internet. And um, so, I uh, I guess I'll say I am a fan of the EU, but I'm not a fan of this law. I think it is totally ridiculous because basically 
the whole web uses cookies to do its thing, which is why like every website that does anything remotely interesting has cookies, and therefore they all have to tell you they use cookies, which is kind of defeats the whole point of it, right? But anyway, so the reason it's a privacy concern, though, there is a real valid privacy concern about third-party cookies. So if a website has a cookie, then they can track when you come back to that site. Fine. If I go back to Google, they know I'm back. That doesn't, you know, that's not surprising, right? Every time I go back to Google, they know I'm there. What some people don't realize is that every time you go anywhere, there are third-party websites that track your movement across all of the internet. And the, some of the ways they do that is through embedded advertising in a website. So for example, uh, Google, Analyti Google, Anal Google Analytics, um, so, uh, or just like Google advertising that's inserted across most of the internet. So Google gets to see where you go even when you're not on Google's homepage because there'll be advertising built into like all these different websites. Facebook get to know where you go all across the internet because the little like button's been embedded in loads of websites. So even if you're not on Facebook's website and you're not even, even if you don't even have a login to Facebook and you've never used Facebook, Facebook know all the websites that you've ever visited because loads of them have like like buttons and things built into the website. And so there's, as you're browsing the internet, the, there are a number of trackers that track all of the things that you're using and the websites that you're going to. You can actually go into your web browser and disable third-party cookies. And for a while, Firefox was saying they were going to make that their, behavior, their default behavior. And obviously, all the adver advertising companies were upset about that decision. And as far as I'm aware, they still haven't changed that to be the default. But you can actually go into your web browser and disable third-party cookies. It'll, maybe it'll change the adverts that you see on your pages, but it'll, it increases your privacy. So cookies have um, the ability to basically tell them how long to, to survive for. How long is a cookie valid for before the web browser will automatically delete it? Uh, and you specify that by specifying an expiry date or like a max age. So for example here, we set the cookie and it says when it expires. Um, or it's a transient if it doesn't say that. So if you don't specify how long it lives for, then it will just go away when you close the browser. Now there are a number of um, security mechanisms, I guess you could say, in place around cookies. So a server can't just set a cookie for another server um, and or receive them, um, which is good. And a server can actually specify when that sets a cookie that it's just certain web pages or a certain subdomain or path that the um, cookies are valid for. <coughs> so for example, like a staff part of the website uh, and then the cookies wouldn't get sent through when you're visiting other parts of the site. Now I'll come back to what I said earlier about the fact that session IDs are stored in a cookie and why that is can be a, a, a bad, like can have some serious security consequences. Not that there's any better way of doing it, but when your um, cookie is your identity and it has your session ID in it, in order to steal someone's identity on a website, literally all you need to do is get their cookie. So, I mean, I guess like if you really wanted to, to have the simple version of that, if you walk up to someone's laptop and they've logged into Facebook and you just go into their cookies and copy and paste their session ID, email it to yourself, you go over to your computer and change yours, suddenly you're logged into their Facebook account, right? Um, but you can pull that off the internet as well, off the network. So if, for example, so Facebook until recently didn't use HTTPS and neither did Twitter or a bunch of other websites. It's really only in the last few years where everyone started to actually use encrypted communications. But until then, there were, you could basically, this is a screenshot of FireSheep, which is a plugin for Firefox. You could basically go to a cafe with an open Wi-Fi, sit there, and you can see everyone around you that's just logged into Facebook, and you see their accounts pop up, and you can click one, and you're logged into their account. Because basically all it does is just takes their cookies off the network, and then you've got access to their account. Because that cookie, that session ID, is the thing that says that this person is who they say they are. 
because they basically the server's already checked their identity. And like, yep, that session ID means that you are that person. So there's a lot of security attacks that work by trying to steal people's cookies. And it's related to um, cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. And we'll come back to those in more detail later in the next couple of weeks. But um, they all basically misuse cookies. And JavaScript can basically, and I'm not, I won't do the demo because you know we'll run out of time, but um, JavaScript can access cookies on a website. So if you can manage to run some JavaScript on someone's um, web browser, then you can basically write some JavaScript that steals their cookies or sets their cookies. Um, so yeah, that's why JavaScript, if you can insert JavaScript into another user's browser, you can steal their session. And so cookies do have some security options. So you can set a cookie as being quote unquote secure, which means the cookie will only be sent over an HTTPS connection. Um, so instead of being um, like HTTP, which is in clear text, where you can just read the cookies over the network, HTTPS uh, is encrypted, but you can still perform man in the middle attacks against people. Um, which we'll come back to later in the semester. Um, so there, but then you need to, um, you know, to be honest, they're a bit more of a complex attack to do, to do on someone, and is likely to trigger, um, you know, certificate error warnings and things like that for the for the end users. Um, you can also set HTTP only for a cookie, which means JavaScript can't access the cookie, and it will mean that the cookie only gets basically automatically saved and sent to the server and JavaScript doesn't get at it, which can which you should do if you don't need JavaScript to get at it. Um, and same site is a setting for a cookie where you can specify that it only gets sent to the same domain. And um, path uh, will set which pages that the cookie gets sent to. Okay, so once you're authenticated, I said this already, your session ID is basically bound to your identity. And so if you can steal the token, then you get access to their account. Um, the tokens usually in cookies because there are those security options I just talked about. And actually, it's one of the better ways of doing this. Um, there are worse ways of doing it, that if you're trying to test a security, the security of a website, if the um, session ID is stored in the URL, for example, like as a parameter, that's not a secure way of doing it. Um, you can also have a... Um, in like hidden fields, uh, and there's a lot, you know, other ways of doing it, but they're mostly bad, basically. Um, some websites will actually have more than one session ID exchange mechanism. So if, if you see cookies, if you're testing a website for security problems, you might actually find that you can also pass a session ID on a, in a URL, for example, which would be not as good. So some of the kinds of security problems you can look for when you're trying to attack a session mechanism is whether if it's a very short, um, say for example a short um, string or um, like a number that's like less than 128 bits basically, then you could probably brute force it. Um, also if it's just low entropy, so another, it's like a low level of randomness. So if, the, um, if it's a timestamp for example, or someone's name or something like that, you could guess that. So you, again you can kind of like do a dictionary attack, or you can um, predict what that session ID is supposed to be. So if it's literally just a date, then you could basically try all the dates between now and a week ago, and you could try and basically hit the server with all those requests and see if you can, you know, if you can succeed in guessing a session ID. Um, the session ID shouldn't contain sensitive information. There's another kind of weird attack against session IDs, which is session fixation attacks which is where you manage to set someone else's session ID before they log into the website. So for example, if you manage to set their, um, if it is like a, a URL based session um, ID mechanism and you can send a link to someone, they click on it, now you know their session ID because they've just followed your link. And then if they log in, then now you can log in as well because you've got that session ID that you've just forced them to use. Um, so a bunch of uh, platforms like PHP um, have mechanisms built into them to do session ID, to track sessions and things like that. You should use those. If you're building your own website, 
it's probably a mistake to try and reinvent the wheel here. Same as like if you're doing cryptography, don't try and invent a new encryption method unless you're a mathematician, you know, unless you're a cryptographer, uh, because you'll end up creating something less secure than the things that exist. So the same thing here, if you're trying to write a new website, use the um, mechanisms that other people have uh, created and that are really well tested over time. Um, and uh, so your session ID should only be sent over a secure connection, ideally, so you can set it as being secure. And um, a server should try and detect brute force attempts. So if, if someone's trying to basically brute force a session ID, then stop them or introduce delays between each request that can make it impractical to try and brute force it. Um, and you can do things like bind session IDs to IP addresses that would kind of stop people from being able to just take a session ID and use it somewhere else. The reason why that doesn't happen very often is because people change their IP addresses in the middle of using the internet. Like it happens for various reasons in real life where you change your IP address changes. But you can do that, which does increase security a bit, which does uh, quite a bit, but then there's a usability trade-off there. Um, and it's a good idea to tell users if, there's, if they're logged in somewhere else at the same time, tell them. Like, do you realize that you're logged in from a second computer uh, just as a little pop-up or something like that? Just if any, and if they are, then it won't surprise them, but maybe they'll find out that they've been attacked. Finally, you should have a way of ending a session, so they should time out after amount of time, um, which makes it um, harder for someone to try and brute force or guess a session ID. Um, and um, Or alternatively, the client can renew or refresh or get a new session ID while the session's happening. That can help to increase security. Uh, but I guess importantly, the user should be allowed to log out so they can basically indicate to the server that I'm no longer on this system. So then the session ID is meaningless now. So uh, because you've you've told the server that you've logged out. So web application firewalls, which I don't, which we haven't talked about yet, and will come up a few more times in the semester, is basically it's like an intrusion prevention system, but for websites. So it's like a it's like a proxy that happens on the server that will stop malicious requests from ever hitting the server, um, and there, there's some good things about, you know, they can do some good good things. One of the things you can do is try and detect some, um, you know, attacks against session IDs. So in conclusion, um, you know, your sessions are typically established with session IDs and tokens. They're often stored in, in cookies and things often and do go wrong. Um, and that's the end of the lecture. So I will see some of you now in class and I'll see the rest of you next week.